All right, we are back with the <laughs> wonderful, the amazing, the one and only singular Eric Fuchs Stengel. What's up? <laughs> leader, CEO, founder of Mawa Environmental Volunteer yeah. Organization, <laughs> aka Mevo. What's good? What's good? And uh, here we go. What, what do you have to say about uh, bees, sir? Yeah, man. So, hi, everybody. My name is Eric. I'm the executive director of Mevo, as Alex said. Um, we're an environmental organization in Mawa, New Jersey, but we work throughout all of northern New Jersey and even parts of lower New York State. Uh, we do everything from trash cleanups and farming to beekeeping and trail building. Uh, and today we are at our bee apiary and small urban garden here in Paramus, New Jersey. And if you look around me here, you'll see all of my beehives. I have pro approximately 20 beehives here on the property, uh, which is right around 1.5 million bees or like 1.7 million bees here. 1.7 million bees. Yeah, it's up and down depending on the size of the hive. Wow. Um, each hive has around 60,000 bees, and that's full size. It can be up to 90,000 if it's like a crazy booming hive. Yeah. Usually it's about 60,000. And we've had bees here at this farm location for right around uh, five years now. Okay. So we've been farming for a while here. Um, the garden that we have on the property, you guys can look behind you here, I'll show you. This here is our urban farm plot. We've had, this is our first farm we ever built. We built it in 2011. Now we have a two, and, uh, two, two acre, two and a half acre property in Mawa, New Jersey. So this farm here in Paramus is a little less used, but still an important part of, the far of our program. What we have in here right now, it, it is uh, middle of June. So what we have is cover crop. This is rye and vetch in here. Um, we haven't gotten down here to plant it just because we've been so busy with our big farm. But honestly, the cover crop is a good amendment to the soil and we're probably gonna cut it down and plant in here in the fall. So I know it looks a little, overgrown with the cover crop, but it should sure. be in cultivation by the fall. Uh, so it's sort of beautiful and zen at the same For time, sure, I mean, man. you know, amber <laughs> waves of grain, right? Definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, did you intentionally plant this, the, is it the vetch that has the purple flowers, Eric? Yep, yeah, so the, this is the vetch here, you can, I can actually just explain it real quick. Yeah. The vetch is this purple flowered plant, we plant this in all of our fields. Uh, the vetch is, and also you can tell it's vetch by the leaves. You can see the kind of like spindly straight leaves like that. Uh, right, right. Uh, the vetch is a nitrogen fixing plant. It's nitrogen a, fixing right, plant. Right, it's a legume or leguminous. And it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere, uh, from the air into the plant's root system. And then rhizobium or a certain type of bacteria that lives on the roots of the vetch puts the nitrogen into the soil. And for our viewers, approximately 80% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. You got it, right? you got it. Which, which is, you know, I think, it's not a lot of nitrogen. A yeah. lot of nitrogen, 90% oxygen, yeah, 1% one, one one, one, one of argon and CO2 and other things. And, but. and, and we need, we need, we need, um, leguminous plants to fix that in the soil. Leguminous plants you to fix it. the nitrogen in our you atmosphere because that will allow us to no longer tune into and tap into artificially created nitrogen uh, nitrogen fertilizers. Yep, so we're, we're a sustainable <laughs> farm. We don't use any synthetic chemicals or pesticides, fertilizers. So our, our input is the cover crop. And this vetch is adding nitrogen through its roots. And then the rye, you guys can see, it looks kind of like wheat. It has all the, right. all the grain on top. Same, the same stuff you make rye bread out of is on top of all these rye plants and the rye adds carbon and organic material. In fact, because the rye went so late this year, we're actually gonna harvest the rye and possibly mill it into grain this year. <laughs> um, which is good. Or, or on the alternative side, use it as a, our seed for our cover crop next year. So either okay. or. Okay. Um, but we seed our big farm in, cover, in this cover crop as well. And while we're on the subject of uh, you know, uh, my, nitrogen, yep. why is it so important to have the leguminous plants that fix the nitrogen using the bacteria, what is it, rhizobium? Rhizobium, I Rhizobium, yeah. right? Uh, rhizobium. Or other bacteria yeah. uh, to fix nitrogen, as opposed to using, I mean, nitrogen is nitrogen. Whether you have it on the periodic table, whether you have it in natural form or chemically human-separated human, right. human um, separated form, why is it so much better to have it in a natural form? Right, well, <laughs> it's all about the soil, right? Okay. So we don't want to use an energy intensive process that produces the fertilizers that we use on our farm. Mm. So we don't want to use um, any type of petroleum based fertilizer because petroleum is a fossil fuel, com uh, contributes to climate change, and is just really an outdated way of farming in my perspective. Um, on the flip side of that though, we really want to support the soil health and we want that bacteria to be flourishing in our soil. We want lots of bacteria and healthy um, soil additives to be flourishing. And the way nature intended it is for plants to do that and not for just something to come out of a bottle and do that. Right. And I, and because we can't right. mimic nature. Right. At least not as beautifully as I, the system I that respect exists. all farmers and, and, and what they do and how <laughs> they do it. And I, and I know some conventional farmers who are great friends of mine right. uh, and very nice guys. They have a lot of passion for what they do. So I don't judge them for using it, but I, I believe that it's much 
it's a better way to do it with plants. And uh, mm, that's why it. we do it, man. And you know, we, we can only show by example, we have the same results or better. And, uh, and that's just from plant power. So it's, 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 power. It's, 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 it's possible and doable. Plant power. And, and it makes me think about a quote uh, <laughs> from uh, Dr. Dixon told me this, uh, de Pommier. Uh, he said, and I don't know who said this quote, but he was giving me, he was re-quoting as well. Re-quoting, all, all, okay. all great minds re-quote. I'm going to have to start re-quoting as well. We're start okay. re-quoting. And he said, it's, it's, it was so simple but so true. He goes, nature has all the answers. Yeah. Now what's your question? Right, exactly. Right. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's already there, man. It's I mean, we don't, we don't need to synthesize it from nature. We can take it with plants and do this exact same thing. So so let's take a look at the bees. So, so beekeeping is a really important part of Mevo. Um, in fact, not many not-for-profit environmental organizations, ex, ex, uh, ex, in, in, also specifically sustainable urban farms mm. and, and community farms have bees. Um, if they do have bees, they have one or two hives and usually some other beekeepers taking care of them. Uh, so we're running, we're running over 20 beehives and it's a massive part of our organization. We sell the honey to generate funds for Mevo. Um, we sell it for about uh, an eight, eight ounce jar for $15 a jar. So it's roughly, I would say decent, 40% more expensive than what you'd buy in the store, but the quality is there and also people want to support us. So they'd rather buy something mm -hmm. than just donate. And, and if you buy honey from Mevo, and I'm not just plugging because I, I love your organization, <laughs> but you are literally empowering your body to be inputting the pollen from the local environment, which you, you are got exposed it. to and therefore you got reduce it, allergies you, and allergens. You got it. These are bees that are raised here in Paramus and if people want North <clears throat> Jersey sustainably harvest Bergen County based honey. Um, that's that's what we're doing here. And so if you're allergic to those those, those fibers in the air, the right. pollen, go get some natural honey and some natural bee right, pollen. Right, right. It'll you know, give your your body is almost like an inoculation. It's like it, it's like a mini little vaccine. It can help a lot with with the building up your resilience to spring allergies. Uh, I've had spring allergies my entire life, and I have a very bad allergies. I've eaten a lot of honey. It has got, they've gotten better. They're not they're not cured. It's not a miracle cure, but right. they have gotten better. Right. And that that has been a big help for me because when I was a kid, I used to not be able to go outside during the spring. And now you know I'm working out here every single day. Awesome. Um, so 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 yeah. So bees are a big part of Mevo, and actually a lot of people contact us specifically about bees. You know we have a farm, we have trash cleanups, we do trail building, we do educational programs in schools, uh, and we work predominantly with high school and college students. Um, I'm 25. The organization was started when I was 16, which was nine years ago. Um, so I've been running it since I was 16 years old. And, um, you know, we're predominantly high school and college students, so we kind of fill that niche. But really, a lot of people of all ages contact us about bees. Um, we didn't know we start with 20 hives. You know, this is, this is a lot of beehives right. here. Um, they're obviously not all right in front of us, but we didn't start with this many. And that's because beekeeping is... Um, the type of thing that people get into and they start to just like get so addicted and they're constantly getting more and more and more bees <laughs> right. and it becomes unmanageable and it's also not good for the beekeeper or the bees like okay. bees are a deeply personal hobby and passion and you want to make sure you can build up that passion with your skill level and with your 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 comfort comfortability with bees and being comfortable with them yeah so so here's the deal so we've been trying to figure out for many years how to manage the bees in a way that engages the public and what we've done this year which is different than other years is we do an apprenticeship program so i manage the bees as a main beekeeper and i have two volunteer beekeepers that work for me for the year okay. so they're two stu young people both of them are either in college or right out of college i think clyde one of my uh, apprentice beekeepers is just getting out of college and Lana is um, currently in school and about to be out of school. They both work with me for the year. So they're apprentices. They're not interns. They're not volunteers. They are quite literally out here unpaid, you know, two days a week for the year. Right. But what they get in exchange for that is a hands-on experience knowing how to do beekeeping. It's not just farming. It's not just getting some your hands dirty. You're, you're going to leave as a beekeeper. Right. And, um, yeah, I don't know everything. I've only been doing beekeeping for about five or six years. But, like, I know a good bit because we have so many hives, and I can give them that skill. Um, well, which is a skill that I think uh, we're so... I mean, I don't even want to like be enthusiastic right here. We're so disconnected. We're yeah. so disconnected Unfortunately. From, Unfortunately. from so much, Unfortunately. let alone your fellow man or woman, but from the environment that you think about, yeah. oh, keeping bees, that's a skill. Well, well, yeah, and it's a skill that the people who do get certified, yeah. exposed to, and, and, and have experience with will be that much more empowered 
as we continue to 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 reach and and, and perhaps tip over this tilting yep. point, yep. this tipping point, with, with with our massive population Definitely. expansion. So because we need the bees obviously to pollinate the crops, yep. and like Einstein says, the bee goes, we go, four yep. years max. So I, what what I can tell you is bees are a, um, a creature that is deeply connected to us as a species. Hmm. So um, you know when you look at these hives and you see the little guys going in and out, it just seems like oh they're bees, you know they sting. That's all, the farthest most people go. Yeah. But you have to remember. Bees have been in their current evolutionary form for many, many years, longer than we've been in our current evolutionary state. So bees have been honeybees for a very long time, and they have shouldered the burden of supporting the entire reproductive system of our planet, of our ecosystems. And not, not every, not honeybees don't pollinate everything, but honeybees pollinate a lot. And, you know, bumblebees, all different types of pollinators you know, assure that this forest, you know, produces flowers, produces right. fruits, Mason produces... Bees, honey right, bees. exactly. So bees have, have have shouldered that burden to make sure that everything is able to reproduce and regrow. So bees are really the, the life form, the life blood of our, of our ecosystem and of our planet. Um, and another way to kind of think about it is, you know, one third of all the food we eat comes from honeybees. So every third bite you eat as a person wow. can be contributed to a honeybee. One third. Right. And, and that's one important third. to remember. You know, our food came from Europe and these are European honeybees or Asian honeybees, some of them. Okay. And they are pollinating the food that feeds us, you know, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, um, uh, different, you know, almonds, apples, different, right. different fruits right. and fruit vegetables. Trees. Fruits yeah. and veggies, uh, exactly. Uh, anything that has a flower you is got most it. likely to be pollinated by it. a bee. And, and that's that for you folks out there that are technical. Uh, that those are angiosperms, like right. angio apple. Right. right. Yeah. This is science teacher in you, man. I'm telling you. So, 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 um, so that's important to understand. And, you know, bees are creatures of the sun. Um, Rudolf Steiner is a biodynamic, uh, you know, the, the guy who kind of founded the theory of biodynamic farming. Hmm. He had a, a series of lectures on beekeeping, on biodynamic beekeeping. And I've been starting to read those and trying to get more and more connected to that kind of outlook of looking at bees. Biodynamic. Biodynamic, mm, right. You know, things so you that hear, are living that are changing. Right. Dy you dynamic. You, change, hear or, you see here organic, you hear sustainable. Right. Well, biodynamic is the... Um, the, the, the deepest you can go in a lot of ways in this type of farming practice. Yeah, it's um, almost like the word lit in the in the kid jargon these days. Exactly. Lit's the exactly, coolest new exactly. thing. About, and, and not just for cool, but maybe most progressive and most aware. You got it, man. And, right? and, and, and I encourage everyone to look up biodynamics. Biodynamic farming was around before organic. Uh, okay. It was the original start of everything. Biodynamic farming has a lot of esoteric perspectives. It has hmm. a lot of connection between the human, the animal, the human, the plants, and the moon and the stars and all that stuff. And sometimes people get turned off with the esoteric perspectives of right. things. Mean, meanwhile, we all have like a, you know, our own spirituality inside that kind of guides us too. I mean, I'm not religious in any capacity, but at the same time, I like I have that kind of like spiritual in, inside me. I know certain things, and right. uh, biodynamic kind of brings out that bit of you. Anyways, I encourage everyone to look at it. It's amazing. But Rudolf Steiner, who's kind of the grandfather of biodynamics, he did a series of lectures on bees, and he talked about how bees are creatures of the sun. Creatures of the sun. Right. Bees. Rudolf and, Steiner. Right. And you got to remember. Being creatures of the sun, they do everything based on the sun. When the sun is shining, they're flying out and foraging. When the sun isn't shining, they're inside the hive. Um, they are creatures that pollinate flowers that are getting their energy from the sun. And when they're pollinating, those flowers are taking nectar. And that nectar, those sugars are produced from the sun. I like, mean, like that is literally, we're talking, literally produced we're talking, from the sun. They breathe in CO2, <laughs> these You got plants. it, man. Photosynthesis. They take up the H2O, the water, and... and, and uh, then they use the sunlight, the activation energy, and they, they scramble that hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, and bam, C6, you H2O, got it, six. And We have delicious honey. We have delicious, beautifully. You got it. Almost like the most, it's almost like the the sprouts, right? Eat the sprouts of the plant. They have that, that, that sunlight energy. Exactly. It's the most purest form. Exactly. The nectar is a product of the sun. Bees take that nectar, they process it into honey that we then eat. So... Nectar of the gods. Right. And, and, and bees, all, there's a lot of other connections between bees and the sun. That's just a, a top level thing yeah. to understand. But so bees are very connected to the sun. And once we start to lose bees as, as a su supporter of our ecosystem and our livelihood and survival, um, that, that gets scary. You know, without bees, we, we really can't survive. So, so let's talk a little bit more about beekeeping. So, hey, just one second. Yeah. Natural capital comes to mind. Yep. I mean, how much can we attribute, and I'll always say this, this beautiful tree over here. 
in, in, in capitalistic United States dollars. The amount of carbon <laughs> it fixes, the amount of oxygen it exactly. gives off as a waste you product that we breathe in. So these bees have value, not just for the honey that you sell and the, and the honey, but because the because we, we, we directly depend upon them. We yeah. can't send out a, a you know a thousands and that millions right. of thousands of little drones that can do right. the same pollination. They're they trying can. to do that. Uh, they're thinking, oh, if the bees go extinct, what can we do to replace them? There's no way. Right. There's just no right. way to replace bees. Let's prevent it. it Let's not it, prepare for it. Exactly. These are creatures that are extremely resilient. They've been around longer than we've been around. They can last way past us, but we have to be able to live in coexistence and not wipe them off the face of the earth. Yeah. Um, and, and when, you, you know, when you said uh, they've been around in their current um, manifestation, their current, their current carnation, yeah. their body is more and longer than the humans, you're directly talking about Homo sapiens right. and in the evolutionary time at which we've been alive, you you know, versus Pro-Magnet, and this particular species. Yep. It's like the yeah. Honda Civic. You it's got been it, around man. and it's not going anywhere. You got it, brother. Love and it. That's it. important to understand. And so, so. The the bee, you know, people think we can replace them with drones. People think we can replace them with hand pollinating. Hmm. It is impossible. There's no way. I mean, we could we could really try to invent something good that can do it. Maybe you have a big old fan that blows around the pollen. Yeah. But bees do more than that. And uh, without them, we're going to have really be hard pressed to replace them. Right. So so let's so let's take a look at a hive. I, I can talk a little bit more about basically our practices. Um, so I'll I'll just kind of go over everything with you guys. So what we have here. Um, is a typical beehive. Um, this is a full-size hive. It's the second year, so I measure my bees based on winters. So this is this is it's uh, going to be its second winter. So it's it went through one winter, and it's in its second season. And and every winter a beehive survives is a is a is a good thing. Is a great thing because oh. um, bees winter is the toughest time for bees. Okay. Um, for a lot of reasons, but. I have a hive. My oldest hive has been around for five winters, so that's a that's a great thing. Most 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 bee hives do not survive five winters, so they usually die out after at least one. And that's that's natural selection for you. Okay. So this hive here is called a Langstroth hive. Langstroth. Uh, Langstroth, right? Langstroth hive. There's there's other ones, there's Waray hives, Top Bar hives. Um, Langstroth is your typical beehive in the Northeast. It is what most people use. Um, it was invented by a guy named Langstroth. Okay, you, <laughs> you can go. look up a bunch of black and white photos of him and all that stuff if you Google it. But basically, it's just a bunch of wooden boxes stacked up with bees living inside. So we have a couple different parts down here at the bottom. This is called your bottom board. The bottom board is what the hive sits on. It's kind of a fir firm footing. And in front of the bottom board, way up here, is the entrance to the beehive. Which if you can crack around, you can take a look there. They won't bother you. Oh, wow, beautiful. You can see my hey girls guys. right here. Hey, guys. You call them your girls? Yeah, these, these are all female here, oh, too, that you're looking here. at. These are all good. And, and to explain that to us, why are they all female? Yeah, we'll talk about that. So so in a, in a beehive, all of the bees are female workers. There are a few male bees called drones, which we'll, we'll, so we can talk about kind of like the differences. I can actually show you the differences. Um, but these are pretty much all female worker bees here. And uh, actually, they are all female. I don't see any drones. Um, and in a hive of 60,000 bees, you may get, you know, you know, 2,000 to 5,000 drones, which is a very small number in comparison to how many uh, female workers there are. So this is the bottom board. That's their entrance, their bottom entrance. That's where they come in and out of the beehive. So let's come over here. I'll show you some more parts. Beautiful. You hear them buzzing. Yeah, you can you can hear them buzzing for sure. It's like a, it's a, it's such a they're, relaxing. Sound. They're very they're very loving creatures, but they 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 can get defensive if you're if you're up in their stuff a little too much, you know. Yeah. Yep. But you know, we'll uh, we may I doubt we'll get any stings today, but you never know. Um, I'll take one for the team if 